Hi, I'm Prof L. Welcome to Chemistry Matters. And today we are going to be talking about enantiomers and how we essentially figure out uh, the difference between uh, two enantiomers and how we label that difference, okay? So we today are gonna to be talking about R and S enantiomers. Last time, you hopefully remember that we were looking at molecules that had this particular property, that were non-superimposable <clears throat> mirror images of each other. Okay, so molecules that have such a property are called enantiomers. Okay, so non-superimposable mirror images of each other. Okay, so... Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, nomenclature today um, and some terms that you are going to hear a lot uh, in your organic chemistry courses. And we're going to start off with, uh, I guess, what is the property or what's the feature of these molecules that gives them the properties of being non-superimposable mirror images? Okay. So the answer is, well, look carefully. We've got a carbon atom here. Remember, carbon atoms are tetrahedral. We put four things around them in a tetrahedral arrangement. And those four things that we put around them in this case are all different. Okay? So that's interesting. Okay, so it seems, it appears that if we have a carbon atom that has got four different things around it, that's attached to four different groups, then what we end up with are non-superimposable mirror images. Hmm, okay. So any carbon that has that particular property of being attached to four different things, we give, unfortunately, a variety of names, okay? So, they're all synonymous, all of these. So we call them either chiral centers, and chiral is spelt C-H-I-A-R-L, so chiral centers, or chiral carbons, or indeed, probably um, the one that you should use is stereocenters, okay? So these carbons, we would say, are either chiral centers or chiral carbons, or stereo centers. Okay, so um, how then do we distinguish between these? Okay, we, we've we got molecules that are essentially the same. Okay, essentially the same. They've got the same order of attachment of atoms. The only difference between them is that we can't superimpose them. They are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. They are chiral compounds. And again, that's uh, a piece of terminology that you will hear often as well, okay? So that you would say these are chiral, okay? So, um, now chemically, these behave pretty much identically in chemical terms unless they're in the presence of other chiral molecules, in which case they do behave differently. But to all intents and purposes, most of the time, they're going to behave similarly, okay? Physically, these guys are pretty much identical. Now, when we're talking about the other isomers, all the other isomers we've talked about, the constitutional isomers, uh, the diastereo isomers, each of those have got very different physical properties, different boiling points, melting points, densities, all that sort of stuff. These guys have got the same boiling point, the same melting point, okay? The same density. All of their physical properties are the same with the exception of one really, really important thing. And <clears throat> this has to do with your sunglasses, okay? So you'll often hear your sunglasses being referred to as having polarized lenses. Now, what do we mean by that? What's a polarized lens? Right. Let's think of light, and let's not think of light as being a particle today, let's think of light as being a wave today. And so we can think of all of these little 
waves, light waves, okay, going this way, that way, and they are oscillating, okay? That's the whole point about a wave. It goes up and down and up and down, doesn't it? Now, in just natural light all around you, the plane in which it goes up and down and up and down is all over the show, okay? So light is oscillating, light waves are oscillating at all different planes all over the show, okay? Now, when we polarize that light, we can use a filter that only lets through light that is oscillating in one particular plane. Okay, and that is why your polarized sunglasses are so effective because it cuts out a lot of the stray light. It only lets through light oscillating in one particular plane. In this case, the up and down plane, okay? That plane there. Now, in Nantium, so what, <laughs> what, what has this got to do, what has sunglasses got to do with um, these non-superimposable mirror images? Well, it so happens that essentially the only physical difference between these guys is what they do to plain polarized light. In other words, light that is polarized in only one plane. So, in that vertical plane there, the light's oscillating, going up and down, up and down, up and down. Now, if we shine that light through a solution of one of these enantiomers, it goes in oscillating in this plane, it may come out of the solution oscillating in that plane, like that. Now, it's mirror image, it's non-superimposable mirror image, if we shine the light through a solution of that, it goes in oscillating in this plane, it will come out oscillating in the equal and opposite plane that its mate did, okay? So in other words, these molecules interact with plane polarized light in equal and opposite amounts, essentially, okay? So this enantiomer will rotate the plane of polarized light by that much that way, this one will rotate it by that much in the opposite direction. So what we say is that one of these rotates the plane of the polarized light in a positive direction, the other one rotates the plane of the polarized light in a negative, in an equal and opposite negative direction, okay? How do we carry out these measurements? We carry them out using a piece of equipment called a polarimeter. And again, that's all that you do. You make up a solution of each of these enantiomers, shine polarized light through it, and then at the other end, when it comes out, when it exits the sample chamber, you analyze the polarized light. You see if the polarized light has been rotated. The plane of the polarized light has been rotated. Now, your obvious question that you're then going to ask is, right, what happens if you take a mixture of these, a 50-50 mixture, make a solution of it, and shine that polarized light through? <laughs> What's going to happen? Do we get that way and that way polarized light out at the end of it? No, we don't. We get nothing. Okay, the plane of polarization of the light stays the same if we've got a 50-50 mix of these guys. If it's a 40-60 mix, then it will be very slightly polarized one way. If it's a 90-10 mix, then it will be a lot polarized one way, okay? Um, almost to the um, polarization of the single enantiomer by itself, okay? But this is the way that you can distinguish between enantiomers because pretty much all of their other properties are identical. And it's only, well, I say only, that's not true, but pretty much only their interaction with plain polarized light that allows them to be distinguished. Now, those of you thinking back to the last episode when we talked about thalidomide, how could one enantiomer behave in the body so much differently from the other enantiomer and the answer to that is, as I said last time, the body is chiral. Many of the molecules in our body are chiral. And chiral molecules will prefer other molecules of a particular chirality. Okay, in other words, enantiomers will interact preferably with only one of two other enantiomers, only the right-handed or the left-handed. So if this is a left-handed enantiomer, it might be that this gets together with only left-handed enantiomers. Or it might be that it gets together only with right-handed enantiomers, but it's only going to get together with one of them, preferentially. 
And that is why enantiomers can have such different effects in living systems and why they are so incredibly important in living systems. Okay, so how do we distinguish between, how do we name these things then? <clears throat> okay, because we've talked about nomenclature, we've talked about naming, we've said, right, with your longest carbon chain and then you give your substituents uh, a number and the lowest possible number, all that sort of stuff. Yep, great, but what happens when everything's connected up the same? And the only difference between them is the fact that they're non-superimposable mirror images of each other. How then do you distinguish between them? Okay. Let's then um, discuss this. <clears throat> okay. So, in order to come up with a scheme for distinguishing enantiomers, what we first need to do is to um, rank the substituents, essentially, or more particularly, rank the atoms to which the central carbon atom is attached. Okay? So let's say, for argument's sake, uh, let's say, what do we got? Let's say that um, our white is hydrogen, um, our green, let's say, is chlorine, our blue, whoops, our red, is bromine and our blue is iodine. Okay, so our molecule would look something like this. It'd be H, Cl, Br, and I. Okay, now we are going to um, rank these atoms. Okay, and we're going to rank them from highest preference to lowest preference. Okay. So highest preference is going to be iodine. And the way that we rank these atoms is on the basis of their atomic number, okay? So highest atomic number gets the highest preference. Okay, so therefore, iodine's got the highest atomic number, so preference one, bromine's next two, chlorine's next three, and hydrogen has the lowest preference, and that is fourth, okay? Because it's got the lowest atomic number. And in 95% of these sorts of questions, it's always going to be a hydrogen atom that has the lowest preference. Okay. Once we've done that, what we then do is, um, if you're in the lab, you get one of these little molecules, one of these models. If you're in an exam, you go all three-dimensional in your head and you try and figure out how things move in three dimensions in your head. Or, if you're in an exam, you get four different colored pens, like so, and you make yourself somehow a tetrahedron out of them, <laughs> like so. And then you move this around in three dimensions. You're gonna find that this is uh, an art that has to be learned, I guess, if you're gonna be an organic chemist. So there is your tetrahedral arrangement of four different colored pens, okay? Now, in order to distinguish between these, the first thing that we do is, as I say, we um, go in uh, preference order, so we figure out the um, order of preference. If you find that two atoms have got the same preference, in other words, say you've got a methyl group and an ethyl group, so they both have carbons attached to that central carbon, you then go out one more until you find a point of difference, okay, until you find one atom that's heavier than the other, or sorry, it's got a um, bigger atomic number than the other, okay? And then, what do we do? We take our molecule and we arrange it in three-dimensional space so as we've got the atom with the lowest preference pointing away from us. Now, this is gonna be fun because you are there behind a camera and I am here, so everything that I am seeing is totally the opposite to you. So. I'm gonna do it from your point of view. I'm gonna arrange or, so that the hydrogen is pointing away from you, which is the way that it should be, okay? And once you've arranged it like that, then you look at the other three, and they are gonna have preferences, okay? So obviously the highest preference is blue here, the next highest preference is red there, and the third highest preference is green there. 
So in order to label this as a particular enantiomer, you look at the way that you have to travel to go from the highest preference to the lowest preference once you've got the, the very lowest preference pointing away from you. So what have we got in this case? We've got blue as highest preference, red as second, green as third. We are going that way, and that way, <laughs> according to you guys, is clockwise. And so if you trace out a clockwise arrangement of these, of the preferences of these atoms, then what you have got is what we are going to call an R isomer, okay? This is the R isomer, or more correctly, the R enantiomer, okay? So the steps again, assign preferences, point the molecule such that the lowest preference atom is pointing away from you, and then see whether you have to go clockwise R or anti-clockwise S in order to go from highest preference to lowest preference of the remaining atoms. Let's have a look at the enantiomer then. Okay, so the enantiomer, we're going to again orient it so that the hydrogen is pointing away from you. And then let's look at the preferences. So top preference is iodine and then bromine and then chlorine. So what way do we have to go to go from highest to lowest? We are going around that away now, aren't we? Okay, so we're going that way. That is anti-clockwise. And so that makes this now an S isomer. Okay. And that is how to name enantiomers. Okay. R enantiomer here, S enantiomer here. Now again, this takes some practice. And especially if they don't give you props in an exam or something like that, you really need to be able to manipulate these molecules in three dimensions in your head. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Okay? Absolutely it's not. Okay. If we were to um, draw these guys now, and remember we talked about sort of drawing three-dimensional objects in two dimensions, um, what would they look like? Okay, so from my point of view, which is hopefully what you're getting from on top now, let's orient them so that we've got uh, three atoms in the plane. Okay, so central carbon atom here. So we've got the hydrogen on top. We've got red for bromine here. We've got chlorine coming out in front. That'll be Cl. And we've got iodine going in behind like that. And this molecule here, uh, again, what have we got? We've got hydrogen going up. We've got bromine in the same plane. We've got chlorine coming out the front this way. And we've got iodine going out the back like so. Okay, so those guys are enantiomers. This is the S enantiomer. This is the R enantiomer. Okay. Um, so I think that will probably do us for the day, and we are, we've still got lots more to talk about in antiomers, so stay tuned uh, for the next exciting episode of Chemistry Matters, and I will see you there. See you later.